Uh, great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. So now we are going to start the second session of uh, the morning uh, for this uh, conference CESE. Uh, so the, this session, we focus on zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, so first, let me introduce uh, our first speaker of the session, uh, the, the, uh, Shafi. Uh, Shafi uh, doesn't actually need the introduction, uh, but let me just briefly say a few words. So Shafi is the Turing Award winner and also the co-inventor of Zero Knowledge Proof. And as many of you have seen, and also we had a workshop on Zero Knowledge Proof yesterday, uh, so currently we are really seeing this Cambrian explosion for new technologies developed in Zero Knowledge Proof and amazing, really broad spectrum of different applications. So that's what the session will focus on. And Shafi being the original inventor of Zero Knowledge Proofs, uh, she will give uh, a talk on uh, sharing the historical perspective of Zero Knowledge Proofs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Don. Okay, hi. So uh, Don asked me to give a talk on um, the history of zero knowledge proof. So it's actually not an historical perspective, but I'm actually going to tell you about the history. It's just sort of a snapshot in time. Um, so it's. Uh, you said I should point it there, right? Okay. So it's sort of appropriate that we're having this talk at Berkeley because uh, Berkeley hasn't changed much, at least uh, not the Campanile in the campus. And uh, this whole story of zero knowledge proof starts at Berkeley. So uh, I was a graduate student in Berkeley uh, between 79 and 82, and uh, really it was kind of glorious days uh, in the sense we had these very wise mentors, Dick Karp and Manuel Blum in this picture, uh, very ambitious peers, you know, my fellow graduate students, and it was a very young field, the whole theoretical computer science, computer science as a whole. And uh, in particular, there was a class that was a uh, number theory class that Manuel Blum taught. This is, uh, I guess, the uh, lecture notes, first page of the lecture notes. And uh, the whole class, thank you, uh, <laughs> the whole class was about uh, essentially algorithmic number theory. So we talked about you know, discrete logs, factoring, primality testing, things of that sort. And at the end of the class, there um, you know, Manuel told, told us there is this field called uh, cryptography or modern cryptography at the time, and there were about four papers that were published. A uh, paper by Diffie and Hellman on establishing uh, it, the idea of a public cryptography. Then there was uh, RSA by Reshamir and Adelman. There was a paper by Rabin. Um, maybe there were five papers. And uh, it was kind of fascinating that you could use uh, number theory and uh, the idea that there are efficient algorithms or, not, or the idea there are not efficient algorithms for certain problems to emulate these uh, possibilities of communicating without meeting ahead of time, signing digital signatures, and so forth. But that's it. That's all that was there. There was one other paper uh, which was called, I'm not even sure it was published yet at that time. Anyway, it was called Mental Poker Over the Telephone. And uh, it was, this was a problem suggested by um, Bob Floyd from Stanford at the time. And he said there are these two players and they uh, want to play mental chess, I guess, or mental poker. But, um, and uh, they don't trust each other because each one wants to win. So there's no deck. They're over the phone. And uh, he said, how are you going to do it? And uh, Rivest Shamir and Adelman, I guess in some other order, Shamir, Rivest and Adelman, had a proposal where they suggested how to encode cards and then how to do uh, card dealing over the telephone. But shortly after, uh, uh, Dick Lipton said, well, your method might be, uh, makes sense, okay, but I can tell you that there's a way to find partial information about the cards. Okay, so far, no, no zero knowledge. So you have to have, be patient for another five minutes. Uh, so uh, he said you could find partial information about the cards from your proposal. And then, uh, you know, in a card game, that could be significant, right? If I know if it's a high or low, before I pick the card, I might go for the high. And that, um, uh, you know, I was a grad student then, and this is Silvio Michali. I'm on the left, my left. A don't look exactly the same, but uh, maybe we improve with age. But in any case, um, the question was, how do you play mental poker, but this time hiding all partial information? So we realized that this, there's a lot of questions to answer before you can actually propose a protocol. Uh, first, of all, for, first of all, how do you even define partial information? What do you mean by partial information? Uh, and then how do you define hiding? It's all those words in the title. How do you, what do we really mean very strongly that you hide partial information? And uh, 
also we wanted to have a provable solution because we're theoreticians. So we want to be, able, what does it mean to prove it? And even if we did define all these things, what is partial information? What does it mean to hide? What does it mean to prove? Is it really all sufficient to say that we have a, a proposal that works for mental poker? And um, so those are a lot of questions. You know, those are actually hard questions. At the time, they were, uh, a, they seemed like hard questions, and you need to answer them one at a time. I'm not, I don't have enough time to answer all of them, but I want to say that one of the uh, important contributions, which is also relevant to zero knowledge today, uh, was a definition of what it means to hide or partial information. Uh, so here is a definition, which by now seems very, uh, I think people have taken a cryptography class, at least a theory of cryptography class, have seen it, and that is we say, that an encryption scheme is really strong or it satisfies something we can call semantic security or you can call it some other name if you like. But the definition is there's an adversary, uh, this confused person, uh, and he runs in polynomial time. That's the only restriction. Or he runs in some bounded amount of time. And uh, we're saying there, you cannot find a single pair of cards, if you like, or two messages, M0 and M1, for which he can tell them apart. So that is kind of a very general definition. So there, you can't even tell if you get an encryption of M0 and an encryption of M1, uh, which is which, better than 50-50. So better than half plus some negligible amount in a security parameter. So if you see on the right there that these two yellow blotches, there's encryption of M0 and encryption of M1. So it's very important here that this is not a single element, but, uh, but, be, uh, but it's a set of all possible encryptions of M0, all possible encryptions of M1, and you get a sample. It's either encryption of M0 or encryption of M1, and you're supposed to identify. Okay. And then we show that if, in fact, you could come up with an encryption scheme that satisfies this definition, then it will hide all partial information, meaning there's no function that, of, of, the, of the card that you can tell better than 50-50. Wonderful. So there's a definition. And now the question is, uh, how do you actually do it? So the crux of the idea was, the crux of the solution was, how do you encrypt a single bit? And uh, if you could encrypt a single bit, zero or one, so that you can't tell apart whether there's encryption of zero or one, then you can encrypt a whole card, th and then you can, in such a way that you cannot distinguish one card from, an encryption of one card from another, and then you can hide all partial information. And the idea there was, an idea that actually is important even today, especially when we don't just talk about encryption based on number theory, but based on lattices and so forth, was we want to find some hard problem a yes no problem, what we call a decision problem in computer science, and it has to be hard on the average. Okay, so even if you have a, a, just an, a typical instance, not a worst case instance, it's hard, it has to be hard to solve this problem, to, to know whether the answer is a yes or a no. And, but on the other hand, it's easy to generate e yes instances or no instances. And uh, it, it, why? Why is this relevant for encoding zero or one? Because essentially, the yes instances will be encryptions of zero, and no instances will be encryptions of one. So if I can sample encryptions of zero, sample instances or uh, yes instances, I can encode zero. Similarly, if I can come up with no instances, I can come up with encryptions of one. And then the enemy or someone else, if this is indeed a hard problem, can't tell whether I encrypted zero or one. So this is a, already a conceptualization of an idea of what, how you could encrypt a zero one. So what do we need here? We need a hard problem. We need a hard problem, which is a yes, no problem, hard on the average. Uh, and the next sort of eureka moment was, here's a problem, and that is, today I think everybody in this space probably knows what the quadratic residue problem is. At the time, it was just one of these questions that Manuel taught us about, and that was that if you have a number n, uh, which is the modulus here, mod n, and you have a y, which is it, either there's a solution to quadratic equation, y is equal to x squared or not, that is whether it's a quadratic residue or not. And that seemed to be a hard problem. So he said, well, you can't tell. He doesn't know. There's no algorithm to tell the answer. So at that point, we went to a number theorist who's not alive anymore. At the time, was, uh, his name was Declaimer, very famous. And uh, we asked him, because he was a number theorist, how do you, how, what would you say? What, uh, is this a hard problem to tell whether something's a quadratic residue or not? He says, listen, I'm not a gambling man. I, uh, if, you, if you told me, guess whether something is a quadratic residue or not, mod n, I wouldn't gamble. Unless y was really small. And then the chance is that it's a perfect square, there may be more than, uh, so there's some, you know, because among the perfect squares, there's a lot of uh, 9, 25, and so forth, 16. <laughs> um, so that was good enough for us. And we said, all right. So what we proved then was that if indeed this problem was hard in the worst case, then it would be hard on the average. So 
there was this, what today is called random self-reducibility, a way to take, map the worst case to an average instance, at least for a fixed number n. And now we said, let's just assume that this is a hard problem. And, one, and now we have a yes-no question, whether y is a square or not square, and we have a way to encrypt cards. We have a way to encrypt zero and one and encrypt cards, and all based on the assumption that this problem is hard. That's still an assumption, still open, right? 2022, we don't know how to tell if something is square or not in the worst case. Okay, so we had a way to encrypt cards, but what does this have to do with zero knowledge? This is a history of zero knowledge. So the first idea was this, we were gonna encrypt the cards, okay? Then we were gonna, we had some protocol for how we're gonna deal cards to players without uh, sort of at random, but we had no idea no way to tell whether the people were actually following, the two players were following the protocol. So the idea was that at the end of the protocol, uh, you know, like if I encrypted cards, I had to take a composite number, which I knew how to factor, and then uh, n equal to pq, and encrypt the cards, and you did the same. But at the end of the protocol, we would show each other that really these were composite numbers, and what the factorization of the composite number was, and therefore that the protocol was right. So we were revealing everything. But we said, okay, it's the end of the protocol. The protocol has already been played. The winner has been determined. It's okay to reveal everything at the end, except it's not really okay because uh, you know this might be a repeated game. You could le learn my strategy. All these things that don't happen with a real physical card, right? In a physical card, you do all kinds of things during the game, but you don't later show step by step exactly what you've done. So the question was, can you do better? And uh, if you l break this down, is can you prove that you follow the protocol without releasing the factorization? Or can you actually forget about factorization? Can you prove that a number is a square, this y equals to an x squared? So there exists an x, such so a y is equal to x squared or not, without actually giving the square root. Um, and then the next question was, how about revealing nothing? So I just want to prove that the thing was a square, was an encryption of zero, or encryption of one, without revealing anything else. Of course, you have to define what it means not to reveal anything else. But those were the motivating questions to essentially the first zero knowledge proof. So we didn't call it a zero knowledge proof at the time, but this, the name of this paper was How to Play Mental Co Poker Hiding All Partial Information. Um, but that's where really the first zero knowledge proof uh, ex uh, appears, the protocol. Um, so I'm not gonna go through it so obviously, but it was one protocol that shows that Y is a square mod n, uh, and it had all the kind of ingredients, that, you know, completeness and soundness, that if it is a square, you can convince the other side, and if it's not a square, there's probability, it's negligible, you can convince them, and also that y is not a square mod n. So it was po both positive and negative. Something is a quadratic residue, something quadratic non-residue. So there are these two protocols. There wasn't really a definition. It was just we showed that if you could cheat uh, or if you could find something, then you could solve this hard problem that we assumed was hard. Um, and the main idea is the same idea that is used all over still, and that was that we don't, we're not gonna show you the square root, we're just gonna prove that one exists, or prove that one does not exist. And then the two ingredients were randomness, which is still true today, we need randomness in order to do any kind of zero knowledge proof, and there was non-trivial interaction. And today we know that there are zero knowledge proofs in other models that don't require interaction back and forth between prover and verifier. But the first zero knowledge proof certainly required interaction. Um, so, that's the story of how this idea came about. But at this point, it wasn't general. There was not a definition, really, that what we call zero knowledge proofs now. And then we kind of moved to MIT. Uh, so we're not in California, sunny California anymore. Though right now, I wouldn't call this sunny California. And in any case, and there were sort of uh, things that you had to define and uh, realize that actually there was a new notion of a proof here. It wasn't just a protocol where I'm showing you that I encrypted zero properly or encrypted one properly, but there's actually hiding here a new notion of a proof which is much more general. And also that there's a, maybe a new way here to bound the amount of knowledge that's released in an interaction or in a proof. And that essentially led to this definition of interactive proof, where there's a statement that we want to prove. There's a proof, there's sort of three entities. There's a statement, a claim, there's a prover and a verifier, and they can send messages back and forth. And at the end, the verifier can say, I accept the statement is correct, or I do not. And you have to satisfy completeness, so you are able to 
prove correct statements and soundness, you're not able to prove incorrect statements, and all of this with high probability over the coin tosses, the verifier tosses. So in everything that you guys are presenting, at least the way I see it, you have all these ingredients. Sometimes it's not a single prover, you can verify this publicly, sometimes the prover has to know something extra in order to be able to actually verify, uh, approve. I mean, always the prover has to know something extra, but sometimes the verifier has to know something extra in order to verify, so designated verifier proofs. Um, and, uh, and sometimes there's no interaction. So uh, what about zero knowledge? So far it's just the notion of a proof. So zero knowledge was, well, what does a verifier know? At the end, he knows the statement is true because we prove completeness and soundness, but he also has the view of the interaction, he has his coins. Maybe this gives him something. So we have the following notion, which if you think in a minute, I'll show you a slide, you see that it's very, very similar to the computational indistinguishability of encryption of zeros and ones in some sense. Because we said, you know, uh, if you, I wasn't trying to cheat, the theorem is true, and if the vera could have generated these type of interactions on its own, we'll explain what that means in a minute, then this extra interaction, what's contained in the interaction doesn't give him any extra knowledge. So what does that really mean? There's sort of two probability distributions. There is the distribution between, um, uh, the real distribution between the proven and verified, this is the interaction that's going on, but if you could sit in your basement or, I don't know, somewhere uh, in a coffee shop and come up with these type of interactions as sort of static objects, but they look the same to an adversary. So there's an adversary who gets a sample either from that was really go going, going on in the reality or from a simulation, and he cannot tell it apart better than 50-50. So very similar to the encryption of zero one, but now generalized to, simu to these interactions. And the only thing, and then an important thing here is that this is even true if the verifier itself is kind of an enemy and is trying to get something out of you. So even when he's not following the protocol, it's true that we could generate these sort of simulations, uh, simulated interactions in the basement without the presence of the true prover. So then, in what sense is he giving you anything? Um, all right, it's a sheet that's giving you anything. Um, so, am I out of time? Uh, almost? Uh, three minutes, that's good. Ah, so what I want to say here is that uh, whereas in the original protocol, uh, the one in 1982, the, the protocol wa it wasn't perfect zero knowledge, uh, or statistical zero knowledge, it was actually computational. So you couldn't tell apart a, at least one of the protocols. Required an assumption that factoring was hard or something like that. But later we realized that there are different flavors here. There is uh, perfect zero knowledge, statistical, computational, whereas these two distributions that you're looking at, the simulation, simulated one or the real one, could be really perfectly identical, or they could have no joint, there's nothing in the joints in the support that's joined. So they could be completely disjoint, but they look like computationally indistinguishable. And most of, I think, the protocols that we're seeing these days are computational indistinguishable, and also, furthermore, uh, in our original model, the prover was all bounded. He could never cheat you, okay? But in almost everything that we see here, the prover is also bounded. So the, uh, these arguments, right? So we, um, anyway, what are some of the big hits? Uh, ah, before I get there, there's this obligatory thing, which this paper really didn't make it very easily. <laughs> this is to encourage the students among you that trying to get published you know, so first we had this paper called Proofs with Untrusted Oracle. And then we had a paper called, and that got rejected. And then it was um, Interactive and Minimal Computations. Uh, and that got also rejected. Then we had, um, what was that one? There's another weird name, no? No, that's okay. There was a one that I, I don't think I have it, participatory proofs or something like this. The information content of, of, of proof system, that got rejected. Then Rakoff said, okay, this is how you should do it. The knowledge complexity of interactive proof, that got rejected. And then, and then, and then finally, this one got in. I think there was one more. In any case, uh, so we, it got in, that's great. You know, champagne bottle. And it's called the knowledge complexity of interactive proof. That's 2000, I guess that's 1985, I guess. Uh, now, what are some milestones, big milestones since then? Obviously, that's the first paper. That's what I can talk about because I was part of it. But a year later, there's a paper by uh, Goldreich, Michali, and Vigderson, and they show that it wasn't just quadratic residue, quadratic non-residue, but if you're willing to settle for computational zero knowledge, so you can't tell apart the simulated and the real view, it's not that they're uh, exactly the same, but you cannot differentiate them, you could actually prove all statements, all NP statements, if one-way functions exist. And then a year later, there's this amazing paper by Blum, Feldman, and Mikali where they show that you can actually do this non-interactively in this model called the 
CRS model, which I think a lot of people know here, and that is there's a setup. There's a random string in the sky, and if that string is random and you believe it, then you can um, verify uh, uh, proofs that was, were sent to you um, by the prover in one message, and, and the prover is guaranteed that there is, it's zero knowledge, with the same definition of simulation, except it includes now the common random string. And there are lots and lots of papers in between, um, but there's one paper, I guess, in 2012 that a lot of people are using the name, the ZK Snarks, or just Snarks. So what's the difference? One minute. Um, these are succinct, uh, non-interactive proofs of knowledge. So, so far I was just talking about proving that a fact is true or not, but really a lot of these have in it, and also a definition, that you prove that you know the, 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 the traditional proof. So Snark has that as well. Okay. Two last words. Uh, this has had a lot of impact on complexity theory because uh, emphasizing the zero knowledge idea really emphasized that correctness and knowledge of the proof are not the same, okay? So if you want to verify the correctness of a theorem, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to look at the entire, its proof in its entirety in such a way that you could transfer it to a third party. And that meant that people start asking a lot of questions having nothing to do with cryptography about the nature of a proof. You know, how much, do you, of a, of how, how much of the proof could you look at? in order to be, have some certainty that the proof does not have a bug somewhere else. And people have asked this. This led up to something called PCP, probabilistically checkable proofs. It was a new characterization of old complexity classes, which allowed to show hardness approximation problems. Uh, and then there was verifiable of delegation. If you think about cloud computing, computation are done elsewhere. We want to verify it's done correctly. Um, and currently, verification of smart contracts having nothing to do with ZK just having to do with verifying that something is a statement is, ac is correct. Um, so in ZK, there are lots of, uh, um, very soon after the, our paper in 85, uh, there was Fiat Chamir came up with, uh, said, okay, why not using this for identification? Really, quadratic residues and all. And um, then uh, it was mostly, um, outside of that paper, a lot of theoretical work talking about composition of these protocols, doing them in parallel, doing them sequentially. Then in the 90s, uh, there was a lot of work um, talking about non-malleability, concurrent, resettable, exact, different flavors of zero knowledge. And then, I guess, more recent, recent includes the last 20 years, I think. Um, yeah, people have talked even about using this for forensics, using the ideas rather than talking about digital zero knowledge proofs, but sort of in this nuclear disarmament paper of. Uh, Boaz Barak in Princeton, and of course then there was a paper on zero coin where um, a Chiesa, who was in the original Snark paper, and uh, Eli Ben Sasson started talking about using it in the blockchain space. And uh, now we're already in the si situation where there's a whole DARPA program dedicated to, to this, which kind of shocked me when they started. Why would DARPA be interested in zero knowledge? Well, they're interested and they're giving a lot of money. And the emphasis is uh, on having this apply to various you know, legal settings, um, societal settings, but they also have a sub-program there which worries about post-quantum zero knowledge. So that's a big issue these days. Also, how do you base this entire theory on, not on factoring-based or bilinear maps and so forth, but on things that stand uh, quantum computing uh, adversaries. Um, these days people are talking about using zero knowledge uh, for learning, machine learning models. How do you verify that a machine learning model was actually executed uh, without looking at the internals of the model? The model's a bit different, right? There isn't just an input, there's sampling of in, a, in a data set. Um, so that's my last slide, and that is that really cryptography is kind of magic. And uh, at those times, we're talking about verification of proofs. These days, we know we can talk about computations on data without seeing the data. And I think, um, I don't know, what could be next? Uh, I guess it's up to you. Thank you. Question about history. <laughs> uh, so maybe I have a quick question. Okay. So Shafi, yes, it's amazing. So first of all, uh, it's great to have Shafi come back uh, to Berkeley from MIT after. <laughs> right, that's right. Leaving. That's right. Originally uh, Berkeley. Yeah. Right. 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 And Shafi actually right, has been leading the Simmons Institute on uh, theory of computing here as well. Uh, so right. So one quick question. Given right the zero knowledge proof, you guys came up with the ideas you know decades ago. Uh, and looking at uh, the, the recent, uh, all this progress that has been uh, really uh, exciting and so on. So did you expect 
this Cambrian explosion. Uh, what, uh, what did you find the most surprising of the recent developments? So, so first of all, obviously I didn't expect it. Uh, that was my first paper ever to be published in 1982, so I mean a graduate student. Um, oh, that's the uh, first ever paper published. That is right. I had a paper rejected before, but this is the first paper that was accepted. Um, <laughs> Because the funny story is that thir that first paper was actually answered a question with faith, <laughs> thick at the time of our, that our advisor asked, but it turned out that he sold it himself in his thesis, and he forgot. But in any case, um, so I didn't expect it. What do I have to say? It's kind of shocking. Uh, I'm waiting to see where the when the dust settles. Really, what gets employed uh, and what doesn't, and but it's already. Uh, an incredible intellectual endeavor of what people are inventing. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's deserving because this idea that you can actually prove something without showing any evidence that can be transferred is a transformative idea. And it should be used in the real world in a transformative way. Um, and so that's sort of a vindication, even if it's a little, it's like 40 years later. So let's see where it goes. That's kind of my take on it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey.